It's a pleasure to be with you and share my ideas about the future, which we can get by looking at the past. Uh, one of the criticisms of my uh, descriptions of some of the technologies we'll see in the future is that only the wealthy will be able to afford these capabilities. And I say, well, look at cell phones. Fifteen years ago, you had to be wealthy. Only the elite could have a mobile phone. You didn't take it out of your pocket. It was the size of a brick and weighed as much. It did one thing and it did it poorly. Only the wealthy can afford new technologies at a stage where they don't actually work. By the time they work well, they're almost free. Today there are seven billion cell phones in the world, one for each person on the planet. Almost half the people in Africa have a cell phone. There's about a billion smartphones. There'll be about seven billion smartphones within a few years. Uh, these information technologies have a 50% deflation rate. You can get the same capability a year later for half the price. And we put some of that improvement in price performance into better performance and some of it into lower prices. So you can get an iPhone or an Android phone today for half the cost and it's twice as good as it was two years ago. That's a fourfold increase in price performance in two years. That's a 50% deflation rate per year. And I'll talk to you about why that is the case. But it's quite a revolutionary concept. The cost of these technologies comes down by a factor of a thousand in 10 years, a million in 20 years. And it affects more than just the devices we carry on our belt. It ultimately will affect everything we care about. Health and medicine, based on biology, has become an information technology. It was not an information technology uh, really just a decade ago. It was basically hit or miss. We find things that happen at work. Uh, today, it's actually an information technology where we have the tools to reprogram the outdated software in our bodies. Physical things are becoming information technology with the advent of three-dimensional printers. So I'll talk more about that. But the, the way I got into this is I decided I would be an inventor when I was five. My parents gave me lots of enrichment toys. I knew they were enrichment toys because I had lots of little pieces. And I figured if I could just put them together in the right way, I could create magical effects. And I didn't really get much traction for a while, but when I was... Well, I discovered the computer. This was an era where there were only about 12 computers in all of New York City. But I had the idea that with the computer we could recreate the world through virtual realities. We could recreate our thinking. When I was 14, I wrote a paper about how I thought the human brain worked. And I described it as a series of modules, and each module could recognize a pattern. And these little modules, pattern recognition modules, were organized in a hierarchy. So they were kind of in a hierarchical organization. And we created that hierarchy with our own thinking. Now we really didn't have much information about how the brain actually worked. We couldn't see inside the brain 50 years ago. There was one neuroscientist, Vernon Mountcastle, who did actually examine the neocortex. It's the part of the brain where we do our thinking. And he noticed it was all the same. That the part that does high level thinking, like art and music and science, was organized exactly the same as the part that recognizes simple features of visual images. He said neocortex is neocortex. All had the same kind of neurons, the same connection patterns, but that's about as far as it went 50 years ago. Recently I wrote a book, 50 years later, that, that actually has the same theory, except now we can actually get, confirm that theory by actually looking inside the brain with enough precision that we can see your brain create your thoughts, we can see your thoughts create your brain. That's the secret of human thinking, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But our knowledge of the brain is also growing in this exponential manner, basically doubling every year. 30 years ago, 1981, I realized that the key to being successful as an inventor was timing. The inventors whose names you recognize, like Thomas Edison or Larry Page, were in the right place with the right idea at the right time. If you're a little bit too early or a little bit too late, you're going to miss the window of opportunity. Uh, and you can't actually design your invention for the world that you're looking at. It's like skeet shooting. If you shoot at the target, the target's going to pass you by and you'll miss it. You have to anticipate where the target will be. And the world, if your project takes three or four years, the world will be a very different place. Think back now, four years ago, 
People didn't use social networks, wikis, blogs. That sounds like ancient history. That was only a few years ago. 10, 12 years ago, people didn't use search engines. That really sounds like ancient history. The world is changing very quickly. <clears throat> and the speed of that change is getting faster and faster. Our first invention, spoken language, so we could share our ideas and experiences, took hundreds of thousands of years. We then noticed that stories were drifting from storyteller to storyteller, so we wanted to be able to make a permanent record, so we invented written language. That went a lot faster. That only took tens of thousands of years. Then we wanted a better way of producing written language. The printing press took 400 years to reach a mass audience. The telephone did that in 50 years. The cell phone did that in seven years. Social networks, wikis, blogs took three years to reach a quarter of the population. So the pace of change is happening faster and faster. We see now radical changes in platforms like LTE or major new technologies and, uh, and business models in one year's time. So you really have to anticipate where the world will be. So, and timing is actually critical for everything, from innovation, entrepreneurship, romance. You have to be in the right place at the right time. So realizing this 30 years ago, I started to study, you know, what can we reliably anticipate about the future? And I accepted the common wisdom that you cannot predict the future. But I made a very surprising discovery. Being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data, and I thought maybe if I visualized it in the right way, squinted at it, maybe I'd see some subtle trends and I could make some educated guesses. But I made a very surprising discovery that the underlying measures <coughs> of information technology, like the price performance of computing, calculations per second per constant dollar, or the number of bits we move around wirelessly in the world, or the number of bits being moved around on the internet, or the spatial resolution of brain scanning, or the cost of sequencing a base pair of DNA, or the amount of DNA we're sequencing each year, or the amount of data we're gathering about the brain each year. These fundamental measures of information technology are very predictable. And what's predictable is that they progress in an exponential manner. They double every period of time, and that period of time not right now is about a year, and even that is speeding up. And that's a very profound concept, because our intuition about the future is not exponential, it's linear. We think our, in, our intuition about the future is that things will continue at the same pace. And that's because the kinds of challenges we had thousands of years ago were linear ones. When I was walking through the fields a thousand years ago, I'd say, okay, that animal's going that way, I'm coming up the path this way, we're going to meet at that rock, I'll go a different way. That turned out to be good for survival. That became hardwired in our brains. Our expectation about the future is that it will continue at the same pace. It's a linear expectation. The reality, not of everything, uh, not of every technology, but of information technology, like telecommunications, like Intel's technology, is exponential. So what's the difference? Is there a big difference? Well, a linear progression, that's our intuition about the future, goes one, two, three, four. Uh, an exponential progression, that's the reality of information technology, it goes two, four, <coughs> eight, sixteen. Doesn't sound that different. Except when you get to step 30, the linear progression is at 30. The exponential progression is at a billion. It makes a very profound difference. In step 40, the exponential progression is at a trillion. And this is not an idle speculation about the future. The cell phone is several billion times more powerful for the same price, for the same number of dollars or pesos, uh, as the computer I used when I was a student at MIT. MIT had one computer when I went there. It was about the size of this room. It cost tens of millions of dollars and it's thousands of times less powerful than this, this cell phone. So it's a million times, this is a million times cheaper, several thousand times more powerful, that's a several billion fold increase in price performance. It's a hundred thousand times smaller, that's another exponential progression. We're shrinking technology at a rate of a hundred thousand per decade. Uh, so in 25 years, this will be the size of a blood cell. It'll be again several billion times more powerful for the same cost gives you some idea of what will be feasible. So let me show you just how pervasive this is. It's not just computers.
It's not just communication. It affects every information technology. And industries transform from not being an information technology to becoming an information technology, one after the other. And I mentioned health and medicine was not an information technology up until recently. Uh, the enabling factor that turned biology and health and medicine into an information technology was the Genome Project, collecting the software of life. That itself was an exponential progression. It, the amount of genetic data we sequence doubled every year. The cost came down by half every year. <clears throat> so halfway through this 15-year project, only 1% of the genome had been collected. So many critics, uh, including Nobel Prize winning uh, biologists, said, I told you this wasn't going to work. Here you are halfway through a 15-year project, and you finish 1% of the project. So 1%, seven and a half years, it's going to take 750 years, just like we said. My reaction was, oh, we finish 1%, we're almost done. Because in an exponential progression, 1% is only seven doublings from 100%. It had been doubling every year, and I assumed that that would continue for various reasons. And indeed, that's what happened. Seven years later, the project was finished, and every other aspect of biology and health and medicine as an information technology has continued to double every year. That first genome cost a billion dollars. We're now down to a cost of two or three thousand dollars. The first uh, genome cost ten dollars per base pair. Now it's a few millicents per base pair. And we actually can reprogram the updated software in our bodies. And I'll come back to that and talk to you about how that's going to profoundly transform health and medicine. <clears throat> and the progressions about the future are based on <coughs> excuse me, the progressions that we've seen in the past. When health and medicine was not an information technology, uh, most of the predictions that are baked into life insurance and health insurance calculations are based on a continued linear progression of health and medicine, ignoring this grand transformation of health and medicine into an information technology. So I mentioned technology is shrinking, that's a reliable exponential progression. It's a factor of 100 in 3D volume per decade. And <clears throat> at first, an exponential progression looks like nothing is happening. In 1990, we collected one ten thousandths of the genome. 1991, it was two ten thousandths. It looked like nothing was happening. But then, when you get to about one or two percent, it begins to explode. And by, by step 30 or 40, you're billions and trillions of times more powerful than our linear intuition. Here's that first graph I had <clears throat> in 1981. This is through 2009, but I had the data at that time through 1980. This is a logarithmic scale. So every level on this graph that's labeled is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So we're adding powers of 10. So this modest little curve represents trillions-fold increase in the amount of computation you can get for the same cost. This goes back to the 1890 American census, the first to be automated. And people look at this and they say, oh, Moore's Law. Moore's Law is just one example of many of this exponential progression. It is not synonymous with what I call the law of accelerating returns, which is a much broader concept than Moore's Law. They were shrinking vacuum tubes in the 1950s to keep this exponential growth going. That finally hit a wall and they couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes anymore keep the vacuum, <clears throat> and that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes, but it was not the end of the exponential growth of the price performance of computing. It just went to the fourth paradigm, transistors, and then to chips. Uh, the ability to shrink components on chips is going to end about 2020. We'll go to the sixth paradigm, which is three-dimensional molecular self-organizing circuits. If you talk to the chief technology officer of Intel, Justin Ratner, He'll, he'll show you examples of the sixth paradigm.